Alright, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Awesome. Um, got fear? <laughs> got milk? Um, it, it's funny because this week I was, you know, praying and asking y'all, like always, what do I do? And um, fear kept, I wasn't afraid, the word fear kept going through my head. And it was like, haven't I done that? So I went back and scrolled through all the teachings and everything. I've never done a teaching on fear. So, um, and I thought it's kind of fitting to go along with what we talked about last week. I wrote this, I guess it's called a poem. <laughs> Probably pretty cheesy, so try not to laugh at me. I wrote this a couple years ago, and uh, it was just heavy on my heart. Uh, it says, No fear. Why is it that I can feel fear? Does it truly exist? Or is it a trick? A scheme of some horrible force? Are the shadows at night real? Do I see figures, or are they a trickery of light? Yet what about the ones that move? There is one who has no fear. There is one that fear is terrified of. He controls the light and the dark. He alone can destroy fear. He alone breaks its grip on us. He alone releases our hearts from it. We don't have to be afraid anymore. We don't have to fear the shadows at night. For we are in the shadows of his wings forever. He is victorious. Take that victory, use it, stand on it, and make it your weapon. Why is it that I feel fear? It is fear that is afraid of me because of the authority of Yeshua's name. That spirit of fear is terrified of those who are his. Yah broke fear's hold on man at his resurrection, and fear has been panicking ever since. I have no fear, play on words, I have no fear, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I have no fear, for I am his child for all eternity. Thank you, Yah. Thank you for wrapping me in you at the cross, where fear can never be. You know, we, I told you it might be a little cheesy, <laughs> but it, it gets the point across about what we go through. Everything that stems from weakening our faith, from weakening our walk, and whatever it may be, can all be summed up under one demonic spirit, fear. We're afraid the bills won't get paid. We stress over rent. We stress over our job. We stress over our marriage, over our relationships. Our, the list can go on and on and on. We stress over our walk with y'all. Am I doing this right? There's a difference between being afraid that you're not walking right and being afraid that you're going to fall away. Satan wants to convince you and have you focus on being afraid of falling away. Y'all would have you be convinced on focusing on, am I doing it right in your eyes? As we all know the verse, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of Yah. Go to the next slide. The word fear from the heat now. That's the next slide. <laughs> Uh-oh. Are, are you messing with me? No. Okay. Do you want that one? Yes, this is the one I want. We'll, we'll go back to the scripture. NAS, Old Testament Hebrew Lexicon. Strong's number 3372, Browse Lexicon. Original word, it is a re, a primitive root. Transliteration, yari, is how you say it um, in the Hebrew. It's a verb definition. To fear, revere, be afraid, to stand in awe of, respect, to be fearful, be dreadful, be feared, to cause astonishment and awe, be held in awe, to inspire 
reverence or godly fear or awe, to make afraid, to terrify. What I find curious is that the very word of Hebrew, that one word has double meaning. Blessing and curse. You know what I'm saying? Same with the tongue. What were you saying? Yep. Uh, okay. And yeah, and if, if you not pay attention, you can even take the blessing too far and go way off path. Yeah, I agree with that. If you if you get fear of God too much, you'll fall away. That that does happen. Yeah. Yeah. If you're if you're focused on being afraid of Him, and see, here's the thing. There's nothing that I believe about what Yah's Word says that He wants us to be afraid of Him in the sense of cowering off in the corner like you do when you're a little kid because you're afraid of the shadow that just moved across your bedroom wall. Or the boogeyman you think is in the closet or under the bed. That's not the kind of fear that Yah wants in us. There's no way anybody could convince me of that. Absolutely. It is a fear. Huh? Right. We, we don't need the, the unhealthy fear to be massive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. You're both on the same page. Or, or um, be, you know, be wary of. Well, and when you look up, when you look up what reverence is, the word in the Hebrew is the same word that means to to have a fear of respect. And so there's a fine balance between the two. You both are right on the money on that. All right, so let's 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 take some scripture. We're going to look at scripture between the differences between the two, and and get into a discussion on how that affects us in the blessing or in the curse. So let's go to Exodus 20:20. 20, 20. And Moshe said to the people, Do not fear, for Yah has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. That makes a lot of sense. If the fear of Yah is ever before us, then it should sustain us from sinning. <coughs> if the fear of Yah is ever before us, that when the temptations of what the enemy throws in us, whether it be lust, pornography, violence, uh, improper stuff to be watching on TV, music, um, you know, things like that. Things that maybe we do or maybe we just haven't gotten a clue on yet that should not be a part of our life. If the fear of Yah is ever before us, then when these things come upon us, we have this right before our eyes. It's the very same thing as what in the Hebrew when it says, remember the Sabbath day? Out of all ten commandments, there's only one where Yah says to remember. And that word remember means to literally be before your face. Keep right here. So the fear of the Father should be right here. Before us always. So that any of the temptations and things that would try to distract us would be blocked. Or that this would be the first thing we see when seeing the other out of the peripheral vision, so to speak. Right? Let's go to Deuteronomy 13.4. One of the main reasons why I'm preaching on this particular um, topic is because, you know, I talk to a lot of people, I pray with people, I see, I, I get into conversations, if it's worth getting into, on Facebook. And the one thing I see a lot and I see it's growing is fear in the body of Messiah. Scripture talks about that there would be those whose hearts will fail them, the men, the men's hearts who will fail them for fear of what's coming on the earth. We don't need to be a part of that group. Look, I, I want to, you know, you think about the disasters and everything, uh, and we see all the stuff jumping off, we hear about the the believers being slaughtered left and right all throughout the Middle East, and it's like they're just getting warmed up. 
We see the disasters. We see the earthquakes. We see the hurricanes. We see people just thousands and thousands every time we turn around. Thousands of people are being wiped out. Disease, famine, violence, rape, murder, everything. All this stuff. And now, in this nation, there's so much evidence pointing to things that are getting ready to happen just this very year. You know, the Jade Ham situation, the possibility of by the end of this year, the full-on dollar collapsing, all this stuff, things we talked about last week. All these things that are going on. And so I see, in one aspect, I see a balance of trying to get ready. In another aspect, I see people panicking, people in the body panicking, going, oh my God, what do we do? I, I, you know, and freaking out. And the one thing we have to understand that one, that's the production of fear. That is not from the Father. And I don't want to get, a hit, get ahead of myself because there's a couple verses that really hit on this. So Deuteronomy 13.4 You shall walk after Yahweh your Elohim and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice. You shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. We're going to go through the Tanakh and then go through the Brit Hadashah. And for those who may not know Tanakh, the Old Testament, Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. Let's go to the next one, Joshua 1 9. I'm going to throw in verse 8 with it as well. I just think it's, it needs to be together. This book of the Torah shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For Yahweh your Elohim is with you wherever you go. All right. Most of you know that I used to be a fighter back a long time ago when I was a kid. Now that I'm old and... No, I'm just kidding. Um, but the best way I know how to use is an analogy. Um, okay. Robert, you do, your, uh, you do management at the company you work for, right? Yes. Okay, you've done it for years. You've studied, you've done all your stuff and everything else, right? Do you have any fear of not being able to do your job? Because you're confident. Yeah. You know what you know, right? Yeah. All right? As a boxer, I trained for years. I fought hard, all this stuff. I was never afraid that, I, that somebody could whoop me because I was confident in my skills. Now, it's not to me that somebody couldn't. I was not, you know, every man can be beaten. But it was, I was confident in my skills. If you do construction, what do you do? Okay. Well, that won't work for me then. <laughs> okay, being a parent, well, yeah, but we really question ourselves a lot of times on that one. <laughs> but being a dad, yeah. All right, so it, whatever field that's in. You go to school, you go to college, you, you train for it, you do whatever it is and whatever thing that you do. When you've done it and you've been in it for years on end and you've learned everything, you've studied everything, you've researched, you've kept up on all the updates on, on your career or whatever that field is in, then you have a great amount of confidence. You're not worried about something being able to come in and mess it up. Our spiritual walk should be the exact identical. How do we do that? Yah tells us right here. This book of the Torah shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. You want the fear of Hasatan? You want the fear of the enemy? You want the fears of the world? You want the fear that permeates this planet around you not to affect you? Then the way that happens is by you meditating on His Word day and night. You knowing how are you going to be confident in your walk? Not because you're, because you have the power for anything, but because you know 
who has the power. You know what power and authority He has given to you because you know His Word. And by knowing that, you can have the confidence that when Satan rears up his ugly head or sends one of his little imps after you or whatever it is to mess with your life, you're going to do this, for lack of better words. You're going to be able to rebuke it. You're going to be able to stand and say, well, here's what the Word says, and you ain't it. You're going to be able to grab Scripture verses and confess it. What did Yeshua say? If you confess me with your mouth, I will confess you unto the Father. And in that great authority in our mouth that the Word says life and death come from, when we profess and confess, when Satan attacks us, did Yeshua didn't have a direct conversation with him? I've seen too many believers do that on Facebook and everything. They'll straight up start a whole paragraph conversation to this devil. And he even said even Michael wouldn't speak directly to him, but rebuked him in the name of Yahweh. Amen. Thank you, sir. I got one over here. No. But you know what I'm saying? You don't conversate with this guy. If somebody's standing here and, and, and they've got a gun to your head, are you going to sit there and monologue with the man? Or are you trying to figure out how to get away from him or take the weapon from him? Hey, how's the weather going? You know, how about the Broncos? You know, you're not going to conversate with him. It's the same thing with the devil. He's the devil. He wants to destroy you. He wants to take you to hell with him because he wants as many people to burn with him as he's going to. Amen? Amen. So, how about say, in the name of Yeshua, go, but don't conversate with him. Put him in his place the way Scripture says. Get thee behind me. In the name of Yeshua, I rebuke you. When he comes to get your marriage, and you start fighting, and you don't even know what you're fighting about half the time. I don't know how many times my wife and I, bless my daughter's heart, Brianna. She, there's been a few times where my wife and I just start like a cat and a dog. You know, she's hissing and scratching, and I'm barking and, and everything else. And my daughter walks over, grabs the shofar, and just rips it, man. I mean, it stopped us dead in our tracks. We're sitting there, rah, rah. <laughs> I love you, baby. <laughs> you know? Just halted that fight right there. And it's happened a couple times. And both of us look at her just proud as could be. You know, thank you. <laughs> Well, the power of the shofar. Yah gave us that instrument. That shofar means nothing. What Yah meant it to be used for is what it means. Does that make sense? It's, it's the hand of Yah behind it. He says to warn the enemy, to warn of the enemy, to shake. I mean, the shofars were used to bring down the walls of Jericho. So my daughter used that wall of Satan to get torn down because my wife and I were fighting. And so, what was I going with that? I totally had a brain pause. Uh, I hate that when that happens. Cerebral flatulence. Uh, golly. Hello. Um, I must be still oogling over my wife or something. <laughs> um, but it's these weapons. It's these weapons that we know that we have. Yah gave us weapons. His word is the biggest weapon of it all. Armor of Yah says that the sword of the spirit, which is the what is it? anybody know? Armor of Yah, the sword of the spirit, which is the Word of Yah. Yes, I know you guys, but I was trying to get here some more. Um, so, a prayer that we made up in doing the quoting of the armor of speaking it over ourselves. We say, Father, uh, how we did it is, Avino in heaven, 
Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm the Lord's work. Um, Avinu, give us your armor, the helmet of salvation to protect our minds, the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts, our, uh, our way skirted about the truth, to be centered in your word. How does that work? Only if you're in it. Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace to walk in your ways. The shield of faith to withstand the fiery darts of the enemy. Right there is where he gets through the most. That shield of faith is transparent. The little invisible spots where those arrows get through because we are not standing in faith. And a lot of times that weakening of faith is because we're not knowing what is in here. And then the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, to defeat the enemy. This is our sword in every way, shape, and form when it comes to Satan and everything that follows behind him. We have the authority, we have the power to overcome and, and do everything that Yeshua already has victory over. That we, via Him, already have victory over. But yet he's still so successful at bringing fear into our lives. Making us afraid. Making us panic. Making us worry. When we get sick. Now I'm not telling anybody to do this. You do this. You've got to do this of your own accord. When I was in. When my, my family and I lived in Israel. I got extremely sick. E. coli poisoning or something like that. But I got it bad, bad. I lost 30 pounds in two weeks. And the night that I knew that I was going to die, was obviously was the night that y'all took me out of death's hands, because I'm still here. But that night, my wife dumped, she had me standing in the bathtub, and she dumped anointing oil over my entire body. And, um, and prayed for deliverance. We called our congregation that we had been under in Kentucky, and since we were eight hours ahead, it was like, Six in the morning, and it was no, it was like nine, eight or nine at night there, and they happened to be having a Bible study all together at their house. Just out of out of the blue, they decided to get together at the pastor's house and have a Bible study, and then we call, and they're all there, and they're praying over me. The thing of it was, was that at first, I was told, go to the hospital. That's the first thing, and and that's normal. That's normal reaction. Go to the hospital. Okay, I'm dying. Go to the hospital. Alright? But I was like, no. Because one, my experience through many family members and people throughout my life, all I've ever seen them do is go to the hospital and just die slower. And I was like, I'm not doing that. If I, and I said, Father, if you're going to heal me, then you're going to heal me, or I get to die right here in Israel, and I get a front row seat, and the Jew gets back. I'll be one of the first resurrected. Right out of the ground. <laughs> Amen? The point I'm making is, is that when something happens, our first initial response is usually in the physical. Fear. We're afraid of what's going what's, what's to uh, evolve from this situation. We panic. Whatever title you want to put it under. And I'm, I'm just yeah, no way. Let's get into more scriptures. Second Chronicles. There's so much. I mean, this teaching about fear could go on for two, three, four hours. It's one that we could get so in depth on and to break down every detail of what we go through and how much of it that we actually could avoid from going through. Second Chronicles 19.9 And he commanded them saying, Thus you shall act in the fear of Yahweh faithfully and with a loyal heart. Alright, so now let's look at the positive aspect of fear for a second. When we walk in the fear of Yah and we walk in the obedience of the Father, we keep His commandments. We honor His Shabbat. We honor His feast. We honor everything that His Word says from Genesis to Revelation. Is that all of it? No. What else is it? What are we called to do? What is our duty? 
to be a light unto the world. Is that part of being obedient to his commandments? Absolutely. We witness and, and give hope to the lost and the brokenhearted. We talk to the ones who feel like there's nothing left to do. It's time to end our life. How many times have we been that in our, and, and been to that situation in our life in the past before Yah saved us? Or before Yah brought somebody into our life? So that fear of the Father, that fear is not only in a reverence, but being afraid for the souls out there that are lost. That's something that Yah has been stirring in me more and more. And I, I can't wait to see what he does with that to bring the fruits out of it somehow. Is the more I'm realizing how close we really are, the more it is breaking my heart of how many people out there are lost. How many of them will never get saved because they don't want to. Because they reject you because whatever the excuse may be. And the thing that breaks my heart even more so is the brothers and sisters in the body of Messiah who want to go around teaching people that the writings of Paul are false or that uh, uh, Yeshua is not prophesied anywhere in the Scripture. All this nonsense that has taken hardcore lovers of the Messiah and doing a 180 and, and completely converting to Orthodox Judaism and denying Messiah and believing that they are serving God even greater. And yet they just took their name out of the book of life. That scares me even more so. Because those people who have come to the knowledge and understanding of Yah, even the remote bit, will be held in greater punishment than the ones who never knew Him at all. That fear should be in us. Fear enough that we will do something about it and chase after them and say, Look! Even if you get to say something only one time, this is wrong. To be able to have the strength that if you saw, if I saw two gay men standing on the street, holding hands, acting like lovers, if that I had the guts to walk up, even if it means getting punched or whatever they want to do, walk up and say, do you understand that your lifestyle is going to get you in trouble with God? And that you have an opportunity to change your life and be saved and receive a salvation. And even if they tell me in 50 different ways where I can go, the word has been planted and they will have no excuse. Somebody else will come and water it and by the grace of God, somebody gets saved. Even if it's one of them and hopefully both of them. Amen? That is a that is a part of the fear of Yah. Go ahead. fun of or whatever the list goes on. 
And so the fear of Yah, the reverence fear, has to outweigh the fear of self and the fear that Satan hits us with. Amen? All right. Let's get into the Psalms. We've got a few of those. Let's go to Psalm 25. Psalm 25, uh, verse 14. The secret of Yahweh is with those who fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. Ooh, man, I came across that verse. I was like, I love it. I love it. Did you raise your hand? Oh, okay. Okay, don't stir. I, I love what that says. The fear of the secret... The secret, I'm going to tell you a secret. The secret of Yahweh is with those who fear Him. Then He says, and He will show them His covenant. His promises, His righteousness, His hidden things that the king should seek out. What did Paul say? I've been given, He, he was given all knowledges, all knowledge of... Oh, I'm, I'm, Totally butchering it. Another brain pause. Um, he, he learned all things. You know, he says he's taken up to the third heaven, all this stuff. So, this one thing, this one act, this one emotional connection, and the fear of Yah, the reverence, the absolute utterance and respect of something that is so far above everything that is beyond our comprehension. He says, with those who fear me, here's my secret, I'm going to show them my covenant. Are you hearing me? I'm, 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 this is, maybe this is just hitting me different or something, I don't know. That means Yah's allowing me to understand His promise. He's allowing you to understand His promise. He's allowing you to understand the Sabbath. He's allowing you to understand the feasts. What does Passover represent? What does Sukkot represent? And what does the whole picture point to? And it's all His covenant. All of it. Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. It is all His covenant. And by fear in Him, He will show you what it is and reveal it to you. It's like, yeah, Lord. I just, if that don't get you fired up. All right, 33.18. Behold, the eye of Yahweh is on those who fear Him, on those who hope in His mercy. Psalm 34, 6, 7, and 9. This poor man cried out, and Yahweh heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of Yahweh encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, fear Yahweh, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. So let's back up real quick to verse 6 and 7. The po this poor man cries out to Yah, and Yah hears him. Saves him out of all his troubles. And why is it so many times I see it in the body, I've been guilty of it myself. We see something's going on, we've got troubles coming on us, and we start freaking out. Y'all has forsaken us. Why have you left me? How many times I've heard God is mad at me, He don't love me anymore, I must have done something wrong, He has left me. And now I've let, I had that come out of my mouth before. The angel of Yahweh encamps all around those who fear him and delivers him. Did you know the scripture says that Yah appoints a couple angels unto each one of us? Do you think those angels go on coffee breaks? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> What's he saying? It falters. It falters. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, dude. Yeah, man. Uh, falters. <laughs> That's falters, man. That's the best in coffee there is. No, I'm serious. 
Do you think the angels that Yah appointed to watch over you, to lift you up so you would not dash your foot against a stone, goes on a coffee break? Do you think that there's any time that Yah says, okay, lunch time, go sit down. Go eat your angelic waffles. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't happen. They are fighting over us and for us 24-7. Amen? Those are our bodyguards. How many times have we heard of a situation, and especially in Israel, there's three men surrounded by a whole army of Arab people in Jerusalem when they capture Jerusalem. And, and they're hiding, getting ready to rise up with a few bullets they got left and go out in a blaze of glory. And all of a sudden they hear, oh, blah, 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 blah. all of a sudden all the voices disappear. They stand up and everybody's gone. Except one dude, and he saw Father Abraham. And there was a big, giant figure behind him. They thought it was Father Abraham. It was probably one of the angels that was watching over them. I mean, I got goosebumps right now just thinking about that. Thinking, go ahead. I'm here because of my angels. Because of Yah. Who appointed them? Yes. Well, Amen. Get in my car in '65. And you're alive to tell about it. Yes. Most people wouldn't do that. You know, Yah has appointed this. I'm not giving credit to the angels. Okay. All credit goes to Yah. But He appointed these angels, bodyguards, for lack of better words. Yah protects us. He says it. He says, This poor man cried out. Yahweh heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Now, does Yah have to literally come here physically and pull you out, or does he use the means to his availability? Yes, he uses his servants. Or us. Or exactly. Whether it's angels or us. What did he do? He put 300 Gideon and the 300 against 30,000. Who won? That's right. And they never even picked up a single weapon to fight. All the enemies killed themselves. Yeah, buddy. And yet we are afraid of meeting this month's bill or getting kicked out of our house or losing our job. But yet, Yah every day fights spiritual wars and battles that if we were able to see it all, we would probably have to go change our pants. We would, we would die of absolute terror if we could see it. And yet we still allow that fear to have any kind of authority in our life. 56, verse 4. In Yah, I will praise His word. In Yah, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Amen. One of my favorites, Psalm 91. This is one I also encourage people to read every day. If there are two things that you... There are three things. Let me take that back. There are three things that you should pray every single day, every single day. Did I say every single day? Number one is the Father's Prayer. Yeshua said it. He says, Father knows what you need before you ask for it, so pray this way. That should be a prayer that should be before any other prayer you even have in the day. So I'm going to use my son's example. When I get up, I pray the Avina prayer, the Father's prayer, every day before I pray about anything else. I start it off with that, and then I get into the personal needs or praying for somebody or whatever it is. I pray that first. And I'm not saying you have to. But that's number one. Number two, pray Psalm 91 over you and your family and anybody else that Yah puts on you to, to pray. That is Yah's promise of divine protection. Psalm 91. You should pray that every day. 
do the obedient prayer, the Father's prayer, and then roll right into grabbing that Bible and reading Psalm 91 and read it as a prayer. Read, Father, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the mighty. Read the whole thing and say, I claim that over me and my family today. Then read the armor of Yahweh. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. And read that over you and your family every day as a prayer. And watch things change in your life. I'm not kidding. I can say that boldly and confidently because it's His Word and His authority. So I can say that with confidence that you will see change in your life if you haven't been doing that and you start doing it. I can guarantee it because it's already guaranteed in His Word. It's His promise, not mine. Amen? I'm sorry, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. So let's look at Psalm 91. Specifically verses 4 through 8. Now listen carefully. Pay attention. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday, now, before I read the last two verses, let's just cover that real quick. You want to know? You know, we think we're safe when we get into our house. We think we get into our house, we turn the deadbolt, set the alarm, we're good, we're safe. Are you safer in there than you are in the hands of Yah? But yet, why do we have such a hard time believing that Yah's got us covered? Why do we have such a hard time believing that Yah's going to make sure we have food to eat, clothes to wear, and a place to lay our head? Why do we do that? Why do we have such a hard time believing that Yah's going to make sure that we are financially able to take care of ourselves or have a home or have a job or whatever it is? Why do we have a hard time believing that? But yet I can walk into my house, set the lock, set the alarm, and feel a sense of security, which is no security at all. Because if somebody wants to, and they know how to do it, they can come in, blow the house up, come into the house, or whatever it is, and I'm dead. But yet, under the wings of Yah, can anything touch me? Can anything touch you under the wings of the Father? I can't hear you. No. It can't. So the last two verses, 8,000 may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Did it say maybe? Does it say um, some of you it won't come near? It doesn't say anything. It says it will not come near you. Cut and dry, period, plain and simple. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Now, does bad things happen to good people? Yep. Why? Because the world is full of sin. Stuff happens. And sometimes we don't understand why, but it brings God's glory around in that situation that just blows our mind. Here's a perfect example. My brother's wife, Jen, died in a single car accident in 2010. Him and his wife and their three daughters, me and my wife and my two daughters, went from living worldly to coming together in the Lord together moving in ministry together, being in ministry together, our daughters all growing up together, only to have her die. When I thought that we were all, I thought, I was convinced, we were all convinced, we were all going to be in this together for the rest of our lives. And then, bam, she was gone. Yeah. And her and my wife, I've never seen two women tighter as friends and sisters as those two. They were tasked at the hip. And she was like my kid's sister to me. And just, bam. And it's like, I don't understand. I thought we were under your protection. But we were. So was she. There's things I can't share, but she was spared something worse. But at the outcome of her death, her entire family got saved. Did you hear what I just said? Out of the outcome of her death, 
because her family thought she was crazy and didn't want nothing to do with getting into the Hebrew roots, getting into all the truth of the Word and stuff like that. But they were seeing this change in her over the years. They were seeing this woman who went from being severely worldly to a woman who had a servant's heart after Yah. She was a Martha. Man, she, she was on everything. Somebody needed something, man. She was on it. And she's gone. But it was from her death that her whole family, her mom, her dad, and everybody got saved and now live for Yah and now keep his Shabbat and all of this. Hallelujah, man. Psalm 112. Five through seven. A good man deals graciously in lands. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be an everlasting remembrance. The righteous will be an everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in Yahweh. I want to read one more in the Tanakh here, since I've been blabbing so much. Isaiah, no, Proverbs, sorry, Proverbs 31.30. This is for you ladies. Thirty-one thirty. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears Yahweh, she shall be praised. You want to know what the, the most awesome gift that Yah ever gave a man is a woman. As far as in the flesh. Because there's a lot of, you know, he gave to you and all that too. But what I'm saying is, the greatest thing for us to be whole and complete, for a man to be whole and complete, he needs a woman. He needs a God-fearing woman. That is what I'm saying. For Yah, the greatest gift He ever gave to man was a woman. When she is a God-fearing woman. You know, we, we have seen the culture, we have seen even the churches growing up, of how a woman is to be silent, standing behind her husband and never speak and all that other nonsense. I'm going to tell you something. One, that will never work on my wife. Two, <laughs> she will hit me. she will be like, what? She stands right here by my side. It says that Yahweh appointed Yeshua as his right hand. My wife is at my right hand. She is my partner. That is the most amazing woman in the world to me. And I cherish that gift. I, I argue with that gift, but I cherish that gift. <laughs> She is awesome. I would I would not be half the man I am today if it wasn't for y'all putting her in my life. And there's no question about that. Not that I'm some great man, but you know what I'm saying. I'm a whole lot better than I was 15 years ago. That, that was a nightmare. But she being by my side is a, is one of the number one reasons besides that all the glory goes to y'all about all of this. But she being by my side is the number one reason why I am where I am today and who I am today. I would be nothing without her. Because Yah appointed her to me. Do you understand what I'm saying? All you husbands and all those listening on the internet, if you you have a woman who is a Yah fearing woman, that is the best gift you can have in your life. If you don't, then Yah's got one for you. You just ain't come across her yet, but it's coming. You understand what I'm saying? So, amen. All right. Uh, read the Isaiah ones when you get home. If we get a minute, I'll go back, but I want to hit a couple other key ones. Let's see. Uh, let's go to Matthew. 
You know what? I, I'm not. I'm. I'm. Huh? <laughs> I'm sorry, brother. I, I forgot to announce that I locked the door out there. I am so, okay, everybody, I locked the door outside. Okay. You know what? I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm not skipping any verses because the sermon lasts as long as it lasts. I don't care. So I'm not skipping verses. Every one of these are important to read today. All right. So, Isaiah, let's go, Proverbs 29, 25, I already skipped that one. Proverbs 29, 25. I'm not ever doing that, that we, like, we're running out of time or something. We ain't running out of time. You gotta say it because you're wonderful black and you're actually letting me in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stay away from that one. <laughs> All right. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in Yahweh shall be safe. Alright, Isaiah 35, 4. Isaiah 35, 4. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your Elohim will come with vengeance. With the recompense of Yah. He will come and save you. Are you hearing me? When you're sitting there being beat up, you're sitting there going through all this stuff, No, this is how we know. When you meditate on the Word day and night, when you know what's in the Word, when you see this attack, when you recognize what's coming, whether Satan is coming at you through other human beings or whatever it is, however he's coming at you, you can remember, oh, wait a minute. Here's how I know my weapon because I know the Word. It says, Yah says, I come with a vengeance. I will save you. Da -da -da -da. Okay. And then none of you show up. Then turn your back to it. Amen? Amen? It is that simple, but we don't do it that simple. We make it complicated. Because we let our emotions control our decisions, our reactions, and how we handle stuff. Instead of handling it in faith, which is not an emotion... Faith is not based on emotions. Faith is not an emotion. Get that in your head and heart. Faith is not an emotion. It is a, a solid... What's the word I'm looking for? It is a substance. It is a matter of fact. It is what it is. It cannot be changed unless you give up. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. All right, so, next one. Isaiah 44, 8. Do not fear, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a Yah besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. So, we're referring to the only true God... There is no gods. There's no gods. We call it gods for the sake of argument because if we were to actually explain it is, well, the Muslims who serve the thing that doesn't even exist. We can say it like that. Or the little fat Buddha man who doesn't exist. And even though they say they're waiting for the fifth Buddha, the second, third, and fourth never showed up. Except through another fat dude that they use as the Buddha. You understand what I'm saying? You see the nonsense in all this. There is no gods. There is only a chad. There is one. That is Yahweh Elohim. Now yes, he is multifaceted. Yes, we understand this in his scriptures. We see the spirits of Yah and all that he is. He is, And we will not be able to wrap our finite minds around that until we go to be with him. Until he changes our corruptible to incorruptible. Then we'll have it all understood and be like, oh, okay. How did I miss that one? So when, when fear tries to come on us, that fear, okay, I'm going to hit you with this. What's the second commandment say, the Ten Commandments? No. Sorry, it was the first, the first commandment. What's it say? 
you shall have no other gods before me. Do you know when fear supersedes your faith, you are making that a god before your Elohim? Chew on that one. Yeah. Anything that holds precedence above the Father is being put in the godlike status. So if fear controls you enough to where you don't believe that Yah can get you out of your situation, then you just put that thing as a God above your the only true God. If that doesn't smack you upside the head, I don't know what will. Are you going to say something? You're not going to smack me, are you? <laughs> Huh? And it, yes. Yeah. Yes. But do you know in Daniel chapter 11, it talks about that the saints will become even stronger. It doesn't say that literally. It's, it's the definition of what explains what will happen. The saints will become even more powerful in the last days. Now, is that exciting? Because last I checked, we're those saints. Anybody who belongs to the Father is one of His saints. I ain't talking about the ones who get, uh, by the Catholic Church, sainthood or whatever that retarded stuff is. Actually, those saints are all paying the cover. Exactly. Yeah, what He said. I'm talking about saints being those who truly are righteous following Yah. Man, there's just so much I want to say. Isaiah 51, 2 and 7. Oh, did, yeah, I got the other one. Okay. I see Isaiah 51, 2 and 7. Verse 2. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you, for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. That does not sound right. Maybe it follows up. Verse 7. Listen to me. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Verse 7. Listen to me. You who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my Torah, do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. What is Galatians 6, 26 through 3, 26 through 9, 29 say? First it says, You are neither Jew nor Greek, you are neither freedom or savior, you are neither woman or man, you are one in Messiah. Then it says, Because you are a God in Messiah, you are of the seed of Abraham and heirs to the covenant. When we look at verse 2 there, it says, Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. Abraham and Sarah bore us. Did they not? Okay? For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. And what did he say? He said directly to Abraham. He didn't say to Israel. He said to Abraham, even though it referred to Israel, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse anyone who curses you or esteems you lightly. Did you get all that? Anybody? Did you get that? So I did in front? <laughs> I will bless those who bless you. So you have so much blessing on you that anybody who blesses you gets blessed. That's pretty cool. It is. But, Jennifer, anybody who esteems you lightly, I will curse. Then that would give me the indication that God holds you up pretty high. Don't say You're his child, right? You're his daughter. We are his children. So why is it that Satan gets so much victory in that spirit of fear in us when Yah has got us up here, holding us up, esteem, and says anybody who even esteems you lightly, he is going to kick him in the butt. But, I agree, but can he masterfully manipulate you when you've done this? Exactly. You're going to say something to your God. 
Uh, chapter 3, verses 26 and 29. Alright. Let's go to the next one. Jeremiah 1. One verses seven and eight. But Yahweh said to me, Do not say, I am, I am a youth, for you shall go to all, all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says Yahweh. How many times are we afraid of someone or whatever because the look on their face or the look the air about them or whatever it is? How many times have we been guilty of that? All right, now let's go to the house out. Matthew. Matthew chapter 10, verses 27 through 31. Whatever I tell you, Yeshua is speaking. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. Whatever you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very head hairs of your head are all numbered, except for mine. Is that what Do not fear, therefore you are of more value than many sparrows. So Here's three things in this verse. One, um, even a sparrow, a little bird that typically, for the most part, we look at has is completely useless, except to make a whole lot of noise at five o'clock in the morning outside your window. Yay for the birds! You know, I love birds. I love birds. birds are awesome. But I'm just saying. But a sparrow does not drop out of the sky, except it be the Father's will. That's what it says. Did it say except that he knows? No, it says except that it be the Father's will. Can you die if it's not the Father's will? No. Can anything die if it's not the Father's will? No. If it's not my, if this is not Yah's will for me to die, I can get ran over by a rig, thrown in front of a train, blow up in a bomb, and I'm still going to live. All of it. Anything you think of. We need to understand and meditate on what that means. That will. The Father's will. And on top of that, of understanding that you can get mad at me, walk up, in here, walk up to me, pull a gun on me and threaten to kill me, and I don't have to feel an ounce of fear of you because that bullet can't do nothing to me unless it's the Father's will. And if it's His will, then I get to go home and you're in a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Alright. There's only one that can kill the body and the soul. And that's Yah. That is not the enemy. Alright. I, I missed one. Uh, Matthew 6. No. No. I already did that one. 6.30. Yeah, what he just said. 6.30-33. Now, if y'all so close the grass of the field, here we go, this is the one I was looking for too, uh, which, is, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that, your need, that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, sufficient for the day it is, is its own trouble. Key thing there. What do you need to get food? Huh? Money. Okay, money. What do you need to buy clothes? Money. What do you need to have a bed to sleep in? Money. You're all wrong on all three of them. When the, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, did they need money to get the manna? Did they need money for the quail? Did they need money for the water that came out of the rock? What did they need? Faith. 
faith. The rock, is that what you said? Oh, okay. I was like, that's fine. They needed Yah. They needed faith. And what does it say at Deuteronomy when they left the wilderness finally to go in into the land with Caleb and Joshua? It says that their clothes did not tatter, their sandals did not fall apart, but they were still as good as they were the day they left out of Egypt. And yet we are tripping over stuff every month. How am I going to feed my kids? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? We're always worried about this stuff. How am I going to buy this? Amen? Amen. That is fear of the enemy. Mark 5.36 is... Uh, let's see. Mark 5.36 as soon as Yeshua heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. Let's go to Luke 12. Luke 12, 31 32. But seek the kingdom of heaven, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Go to John 14. 14.27 Yeshua says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Acts 18.9 Here's a rhetorical question. Do you know all these verses are in here? If you do, then why are you allowing fear in your life? And I'm asking myself the same question. Now Yahweh spoke to Paul in the night by vision, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Second Timothy 1.7 for Yah has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If we have power, love, and a sound mind, then no fear can penetrate. 1 Peter 3. The rest of these verses really just very self-explanatory. 1 Peter 3, 13-15. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify Yahweh Elohim in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Hey, Ben. Will you go grab everybody, my wife and everybody? Tell them to begin here. We're wrapping up. And the last one, but not least, 1 John 4.18. 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love. Pay attention to what this says. Pay really, really close attention to what this says. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Did you hear what I just said? If we fear, then we have not been made perfect in love. Because fear casts out all love, or love casts out all fear. And if we fear, uh, that should make us really go home and do a heart evaluation. And say, okay, I'll go, what am I missing? It's not to say we don't have love. It's not to say that we are not getting to that perfect love. But it's to say, if we have fear, then we are not perfected in love. So we need to go to the Father and say, okay, what am I missing? Amen?